presentation looks to provide a high level overview of how public procurement is responding to the global climate emergency. Aside from COVID recovery, fair work and net zero arguably represent the biggest local and national priorities of our time. The subject matter is very broad and complex and can seem to move at 100 miles an hour, changing every 15 minutes, it appears. Questions and co common council requirements will be made available, allowing delegates to plan, prepare, make the best of themselves and potentially build competitive advantage in these areas. Contracting authorities have a due regard duty to secure added social, economic and environmental value in their procurements. Opportunities are significant given the spend associated with and the scale of public procurement in Scotland. Councils are expected to assume a leadership role in areas including fair work, the environment and equalities. Recently, there's been a lot of focus on the environment as opposed to maintaining a balance between all strands of sustainable procurement. We are conscious that requirements don't create an undue burden for bidders, procurers or evaluators. We must ensure a competitive and diverse marketplace that allows for the inclusive participation of SMEs. This includes local SMEs and SMEs looking to locate to our area. In terms of the environment, our leadership role extends to providing, improving the ambition of circular and carbon reduction measures. In terms of fair work, this means not only creating and maintaining employment, but ensuring it is good, secure employment with acceptable pay conditions and prospects. This is an overview of what I intend to cover today. The main policy considerations and challenges we face, links to the sustainable procurement duty, community benefits and national outcomes. Finally, the transformation to net zero, how it will impact on our current practice and ultimately affect bidders. Challenges for us include maintaining a balance without net zero overshadowing absolutely everything. Also, how to pitch requirements that are simple and clear proportionate and relevant, non-discriminatory, capable of like-for-like -like evaluation and capable of contract management. This slide provides some context to the scale of public procurement. Public procurement spend amounts to approximately £12.6 billion per annum in Scotland. The global climate emergency is a strategic national priority and a central part of a green wellbeing recovery. Actions for the public sector include assisting to create a culture that supports a circular economy, promoting strategic thinking on demand management and procuring for reuse, redesign and remanufacture. Also, using our influence to stimulate action in supply chains. This slide outlines the Council's overarching objectives and is taken from our joint procurement strategy. Our commitments include supporting sustainable, inclusive economic growth, identifying leverage opportunities aligned to the needs and priorities of our communities and maximising opportunities for the local supply chain, SMEs in general and the third sector to the full extent we're permitted to do so. This slide compares the sustainable procurement duty and community benefits, two concepts you might be familiar with. Different financial thresholds apply, but they essentially lead to the same end improving social, economic and environmental well-being. The key message is that value for money remains important, but we must look to generate wider benefits to our communities and wider society. Both duties guide the delivery of expectations. It's mandatory to consider community benefits where the contract is over £4 million. The sustainable procurement duty kicks in at £50,000 for goods and services and £2 million for works. In practice, seeking added value is strongly encouraged in contracts considerably below the four million, fifty thousand pounds, and two million pound thresholds. Added value means beyond what is bought and paid for. Requirements must be proportionate and relevant according to the length, value, and nature of the contract. We as procurers shouldn't lose sight of the core requirement. Be excessive in you know what we demand of bidders or create any kind of bitter discrimination in terms of the size, resources available to, or capabilities that we can reasonably expect of bidders. Environmental well-being and many other requirements can be addressed as community benefits or in the specification, or there could be elements of both. This slide shows the national performance framework which we work towards. 
The framework is refreshed every five years with the next review scheduled for 2023. In simple terms, the framework demonstrates at a high level what Scotland wants for Scotland. And with the reviews built in, it, it's scheduled to you know, carry on until 2033. In terms of the environment, one of the element states we value, enjoy, protect and enhance our environment. Bidders might want to consider cross-referencing their bid responses with the National Performance Framework. It tends to demonstrate to evaluators a very deep understanding of the contracting authority's requirements. Climate emergency and procurement's response to it is about more than just carbon or greenhouse gases. Expectations touch on a wide range of outcomes, all considered essential to a green well-being economy. In simple terms, the circular economy is concerned with prolonging the useful life of an asset and keeping all waste to a minimum. This is in contrast to a linear economy, which is based on a take, make, consume and throw away model. When a product reaches the end of its useful life, as much as possible should be kept within the economy, i.e. productively using assets again and again and creating further value. The circular economy can be looked at in terms of your trash can be your treasure. This slide shows various practical ways in which the circular economy can be included in procurement activity and become mainstreamed as business as usual. Many of the recommended measures boil down to designing for longevity and reuse. Included within the slide pack are various Zero Waste Scotland case studies and practical examples of the circular economy in action. This slide illustrates with quite a stark message that four fifths of Scotland's carbon footprint comes from products and materials. Scotland's target is to secure net zero emissions by 2045. This is five years ahead of the UK government, so it's extremely ambitious and the expectations are really high. While the circular economy links to and will be an integral, integral part of the net zero agenda, it might ultimately not be possible to measure the impact in terms of X tonne CO2. That is no reason not to embed and mainstream circular economy principles into core business activities. The principles are likely to form an increasingly important part of public procurement, either as part of the specification, as added value, or elements of both. This slide shows the vast range of benefit types commonly used by the Council. Clauses for these exist in community benefit project plans. The project plans have been uploaded with materials and are available for delegates to, to look at at a later date. Some are reporting obligations and some are much more challenging. For example, apprentices, placements and community support. This slide illustrates the steps we have taken to improve our approach to environmental well-being and be conscious of the net zero agenda. The features of the question that we're now asking include the potential for supplier annual reports. We've still to look at the, the form and content of those. Partnership working, a culture of volunteering good practice, as well as a culture of saving money, as well as improving sustainability credentials. For example, there's quite a number of government grants. You know, if any business is looking to review their fleet composition, moving from you know, petrol and diesel to electric and potentially hydrogen. And also there's there's funds potentially available for energy efficiency in buildings. The Mission Net Zero Toolkit could be particularly valuable here, and we hope to be in a position to promote the benefits to bidders in our tenders. Contracting authorities and suppliers are undoubtedly on a bit of a journey with this. We don't want to compromise the competitiveness of smaller, possibly local suppliers by radically changing our approaches and focus overnight. This clause is similar to the previous slide, but it highlights fuel poverty as a major priority at a local and national level. Again, requirements emphasise partnership working and assisting the Council and our partners in cascading cli positive climate literacy messaging at a consumer and business to business level. In conclusion, expectations are increasing and our approaches to environmental well-being and net zero are likely to become more demanding from a bidder perspective. At present, it is not possible to reliably separate out organisational credentials from project-specific operational measures. 
or produce a reliable carbon baseline at pre-tender stage. If it was possible to produce a carbon baseline pre-tender, suppliers could be held to that standard or encouraged to innovatively improve upon it. This is where we hope tools and resources like the Met Net Mission Net Zero Toolkit can support suppliers. Carbon innovation could conceivably lead to a radical reassessment of award criteria in public procurement. Subject to third party verification, it is possible there could be price incentives for verified delivery of carbon savings and improving on baselines. A challenge here is the relatively short duration of construction projects and longer term evidence requirements. Scotland and all governments are looking to demonstrate a positive, consistent and credible contribution to the global climate emergency. There is consensus on the direction of travel, but the means of achieving net zero and the pace of change is less clear. Collaborative working, such as our partners at Supplier Development Programme, Living Wage Scotland and Mission Net Zero will be pivotal to future success. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, I'm Emily from Edinburgh Science and I'd like to thank the Supplier Development Programme um, for allowing me to be here today to talk to you about the Net Zero Toolkit, um, which is a free and simple eight step toolkit that we've developed um, to help SMEs get on track towards Net Zero. So yeah, first just a quick background um, really about who we are and why we've developed this toolkit. Um, so Edinburgh Science is the charity that runs the Edinburgh Science Festival. Um, we've been including the climate in our festival programming uh, for a number of years now. Um, and kind of more recently, we've turned to um, trying to take direct action on climate change um, involving businesses. So we um, we work with a lot of businesses across the science, technology, engineering um, sectors. So um, we've actually got quite a strong convening power to bring people together. Um, we established a series of roundtable meetings called the Climate Opportunity Ideas Factory in 2019, um, which was designed to provide a forum um, for organisations to come together and um, brainstorm, collaborate, create meaningful solutions um, to climate change. So one idea that came out of these meetings was um, of this Net Zero Toolkit, um, which was supported by Bailey Gifford, the Edinburgh Investment Company, um, and a number of other um, funding partners as well. Um, so the reason we developed this toolkit um, really was because we realised there was a bit of a gap, um, a gap in the market for um, something which provided businesses with um, kind of practical support um, and resources to um, help their decarbonisation journey. Um, there's quite a number of carbon pledges out there that you might have come across, um, which encourage organisations to commit to net zero um, or to lower carbon by a certain date. Um, but when we were researching this idea with um, Edinburgh University, we um, actually realised that a lot of this is quite meaningless without um, without that kind of support and the resource to back it up. Um, so essentially we found with the businesses that we spoke to, um, they were really keen to have um, a bank of resources to help them um, fulfil any pledges that they made. Um, so that was essentially why we created this um, simple eight step toolkit. We also wanted to break down carbon management a bit because um, we realised particularly for um, SMEs, for the smaller SMEs, um, carbon management can be incredibly time consuming and um, resource intensive. There's a lot of information out there on the internet um, to help you, but um, again, it can be overwhelming. It can be sometimes difficult to know where to start. Um, so that's why we've kind of rolled it all together um, and broken it down as um, a guidance for businesses. Um, so I just wanted to talk you through um, what the eight steps of the toolkit are. Um, so they don't have to be completed in um, order necessarily. Um, they just kind of, you know, some of them can be completed in parallel. Um, they're just designed to um, break down carbon management into kind of digestible um, sections. So the first step um, is to understand how climate change um, actually impacts on your business. Um, for example, it might be that flooding's affected you this year. I know it certainly has um, down here in Edinburgh affected um, some businesses. Um, so kind of the reason for this step really is um, just that you can see how climate change is going to have a direct impact on um, your business as well as kind of the wider world. Um, I think sometimes that can provide a good um, motivation for making change. Um, the second step encourages you to run your business on 100% renewable energy. Um, so the toolkit provides um, advice and guidance on renewable tariffs um, and on getting kind of in situ renewables, um, such as solar panels, for example, on your premises as well. 
Uh, the third step talks about running your business on 100% renewable space heating, um, which can be a bit harder. Um, a lot of the options for heating out there um, at the moment are still um, gas boilers, but increasingly they're uh, um, low carbon options. Um, heat batteries, for example, um, and solar thermal heating. Um, so the toolkit provides advice and guidance um, on those as well, so you can see if that's a feasible option for your business. The fourth step um, encourages you to have a zero emission vehicle fleet, um, if that's applicable and achievable for your business. Um, otherwise, it talks you through um, how to lower your transport emissions in other areas. Um, Step five is a bit more, um, can be a bit more kind of specific to your business. Um, so it talks about um, currently unavoidable CO2 emissions, um, which could be operational. Um, for example, if you're a construction company, it might be um, emissions caused by the movement of plant traffic across the building site, for example. Um, step six encourages you to set zero emission targets. Um, now, I know I said you don't have to do the steps of the toolkit in order, but I think um, the target setting um, step is um, quite a good follow on from um, completing the first five steps um, completing the first five steps will get you kind of more familiar with um, what your kind of carbon management plans and strategies would be over the next um, 12 months over the next five years, perhaps. Um, and then that can provide a um, kind of solid basis for setting um, realistic and achievable targets. Uh, step seven encourages you to begin the divestment journey for your business. Um, so making sure your pensions, insurance, savings are invested um, sustainably. And uh, finally, the uh, last step of the toolkit encourages you to help um, decarbonize your business's own value chain. So by telling your suppliers to take action. Um, so I just wanted to give you a glimpse inside the toolkit um, to see what it looks like from the user end. Um, unfortunately, this is a screenshot, so I can't um, scroll down. But um, you'll note that most um, of the steps are kind of written out as forms. So, um, for example, step five here, you have the option to select the um, types of emission that are applicable to your business. Um, and then you've got a number of text boxes here. So the first one um, encourages you to write out how you're going to establish and monitor these emissions. So you can provide a summary of that in there. Um, further down this page, um, the form encourages you to talk about how you plan to reduce these emissions and how you plan to offset in the meantime. Um, now, at this point, you might be thinking, oh, my goodness, how do I do this? Um, but that's why we've got this big orange guidance notes button in the middle here. So if you click on that, it will open up in another window. Um, the guidance notes for each step uh, kind of vary, but most of them do include a little kind of sub step by step guide um, on how to complete um, that particular part of the toolkit. Uh, for step five as well, um, it also includes some case studies um, from real businesses um, who've gone through the toolkit, uh, so you can look to them for inspiration um, and see what they've done. Um, then the tools and information section um, is essentially it's the main body of the toolkit. So you see we've got a kind of variety of resources here. Um, we've got, for example, a guide to scope three emissions. Um, so those emissions which aren't kind of directly caused by you and your office. Um, but are attributable to your business and um, they can sometimes be quite hard to pick apart. Um, so we provide kind of guidance on those um, and a carbon footprint calculator um, as well. Um, so at the end of your toolkit, you will be able to download all of your answers that you've input um, as a PDF. Uh, so detail is key here. Um, this can be, you know, this can be quite um, a useful resource um, when you have all of your kind of carbon management um, strategy summarized in one place. Um, you could even use this to support um, a bid to a local authority, for example. Um, you could use it um, to show other organizations what you're doing, um, support them. Um, yeah, so just to talk about the benefits really um, of the toolkit to you um, as a bidder to a local authority. Um, so the increasingly local authorities' requirements um, going to kind of tighten um, on carbon and um, I think well that's why I'm here speaking to you today. Um, so Net Zero Toolkit empowers you to take practical action um, towards reducing your emissions um, so not just making commitments um, but fulfilling them as well. Um, it helps you to monitor your emissions um, year on year uh, so that you can kind of account for any reductions that you've made and that may help you to um, win bids in the future. Um, so it provides in-depth guidance as well on um, carbon benchmarking, so establishing your current emissions um, takes you through the process step by step. Carbon benchmarking can normally be quite a um, 
intensive and time consuming process um, as you kind of have to trawl through old um, old gas bills and um, that kind of thing and consider other emissions that you might not have considered before. Um, so the Net Zero Toolkit provides um, a kind of succinct guide with um, online tools that can help you. Um, and this, this will kind of help to buy you time as well to actually decarbonize. Um, so we've got kind of links on the toolkit to um, obviously tools and resources that can help you, but also consultancies as well. Um, and one of our partners um, at Compare Your Footprint actually offering a free 20 minute consultation um, to users of the Net Zero Toolkit. So um, make sure you take advantage of that if you um, complete a toolkit. Um, and then another benefit of the toolkit as well is, um, I think, as I mentioned before, really with the PDF, it allows you to summarize your carbon management actions um, and your plans all in one place. Um, if you haven't thought about a carbon strategy yet, then um, actually your PDF can provide a pretty strong uh, basis of what that should be. Um, if you have a kind of carbon strategy in place, um, you can summarize that um, in your toolkit as well and um, use your PDF to showcase that. Um, so additionally, um, the toolkit will connect you to other organizations um, and it kind of facilitates conversations. So you can use your toolkit um, as a basis to discuss with um, perhaps local charities. Um, I know you've got SCARF um, up in Aberdeen. Um, so you can use the uh, document from your toolkit um, as the basis of discussion um, of your plans with them and then they might be able to um, use that to help you. Um, and then in general, the kind of benefits really um, to small businesses and um, any business of any size really of decarbonizing um, I think includes certainly financial savings um, and remaining competitive. Um, so financial savings, I think generally carbon savings um, go hand in hand with cost savings. So for example, if you put solar panels on your roof, um, you're definitely gonna encounter some free electricity um, and that can, um, that can contribute to um, quite substantial cost savings, which will outweigh the initial investment, um, hopefully in just a few years. Um, I think the key thing, though, to note is that um, in order to remain competitive, um, decarbonising is um, super necessary. Um, so as well as local authorities looking to decarbonise their value chain, um, I think increasingly um, other clients will be looking to decarbonise um, their value chains as well um, in response to policy changes um, from the Scottish government, from the UK government, um, but also in response to pressure from their buyers, um, which might be other businesses, might be consumers. Um, and I think especially since the um, sixth IPCC report was released um, in August, that kind of came as a really stark reminder um, and a call to action like no other really. Um, so I think now carbon management isn't just a nice to have, um, but it's business critical. Um, so there's a few endorsements here um, to read through from early adopters of the Net Zero Toolkit, um, some small businesses um, that have been using this. Um, so I don't think I have very much time left, um, but those will be on the slides um, when they get sent out to you, um, so you can have a read through them then. Um, but yeah, for now, I'd just like to um, thank you for having me speak to you today um, and see if you've got any questions for me. Thanks. Hello, my name is Lynn Anderson. I work at the Poverty Alliance as the manager of our Living Wage Scotland programme. So the Poverty Alliance are Scotland's anti-poverty network. Our members want to see poverty solved in Scotland. And part of this is to encourage action that makes a positive difference to people living on low incomes. And that's where Living Wage Scotland comes in. So in terms of poverty in Scotland, as a society, we believe that working families should be able to achieve a decent standard of living, but too many people across Scotland are living in the grip of poverty. I mean, even before the onset of the coronavirus pandemic, around a million people in Scotland were already in poverty. But almost a quarter of children in Scotland are living in poverty, which simply isn't right. A particular concern for the Poverty Alliance is the increase in in-work poverty. Indeed, most of the children that are living in poverty are actually living in a household where at least one adult is working. So this demonstrates that despite the high levels of unemployment that the UK economy has enjoyed in the recent past, and there's been an increase in statutory wage rates too for low earners over the years, these interventions aren't enough to release workers from poverty's grip. So increasing early wage rates is an effective means of delivering extra cash directly into the pockets of low paid workers. Now, the real living wage is not a solution on its own to tackle in work poverty, but it is an important one.
So today I'm going to outline some of the ways in which Living Wage Scotland celebrates employers that pay the real living wage. And I'm calling upon employers here today to consider joining the growing living wage movement in Scotland. What is the real living wage? Well, it's important to clarify that first. So it's currently set at £9.50 per hour. There is a higher London rate that's set at £10.85. Now, employers will already be familiar with the legal requirements to pay staff the minimum wage rate for the age group. That includes the highest band of statutory wages, which is termed the national living wage. Statutory wage rates are not a real living wage. And the difference is significant for workers that are entitled to that top band, the national living wage for their age group. That's currently £8.92 per hour. If they were earning the real living wage, they would be getting an extra £1,500 per year. So the key thing, the key difference is that employers choose to pay the real living wage. It's a voluntary commitment to a wage that reflects living costs. It's calculated using the best available evidence in the UK on living standards. Now, the new rates are calculated each year and are announced every November during Living Wage Week. Now, employers might choose simply to match the rate, go ahead and implement that and, and, and shadow it and just keep an eye for those announcements coming out each year. But what Living Wage Scotland aims to do is to demonstrate that employers are supporting the living wage by confirming the living wage commitment through an accreditation scheme. So by becoming an accredited living wage employer, it means that you can be recognised for your commitment to fair pay. And that's important when bidding for public sector contracts. Employers are increasingly asked to evidence their fair work practice. So living wage accreditation is a really simple way to signal that to not just for the purpose of the tender, but to your own staff, your customers, your competitors, um, that you're proud to be a living wage employer. There is a modest fee for accreditation, so it's based on the number of staff you employ. Starting at smaller organisations employing up to 10 staff, for example, the fee is £72, including VAT. And it works. There's been a significant impact. It's not just the number of employers, you know, the extra wages that have went into low paid workers' pockets as a result of accreditation in Scotland. That's at £240 million. The UK figure is £1.5 billion, so it's certainly impactful. So when we ask employers why they become living wage accredited, they'll largely say because it's the right thing to do. But there are a range of benefits. Workers, of course, benefit with the extra wages. They can better meet their everyday needs. They can cover unexpected costs. And in turn, it can boost their health, their well-being, their enjoyment of work and life. But businesses can benefit from that happier, healthier, more motivated workforce. They can better recruit staff. They can keep them for longer, reducing staff turnover and saving on long-term training costs and of course they can gain a boost in company reputation as a result. So to become accredited we ask that employers complete a license agreement that awards the license rights to use the living wage logo. So in return for those license rights there are some criteria to be met. The first criteria is employers must pay all the directly employed staff that are aged 18 and over at least the real living wage rate and that can be more challenging in some sectors compared to others. But the second criteria is to think beyond directly employed staff and also look at workers that are regularly carrying out services on the premises, even if they're not directly employed. So workers like cleaners, caterers, security, facilities management, these workers might be employed through third party contractors, but they're still very much on site and interacting with your with your workforce probably feel part of the workforce so they are in the scope of accreditation and so those contracts must be moved on to the real living wage if not immediately then at the earliest opportunity we call that a milestone we set a milestone to move these contracts um onto the real living wage over over time now that can be straightforward for a small business who you know it might just involve a conversation with the with the cleaning company for example but for organisations with large and complex supply chains, it can obviously become quite an undertaking. So local authorities, NHS boards, um, these types of organisations, they must look at their supply chain and identify the contracts that are in scope um, and, and, and make a plan to move those contracts onto the real living wage as soon as possible. But we're here to help and support through that process too. The other key thing is that the rate changes each year. We announce the new rate in November. And employers that are accredited are asked to implement that new rate within six months of our announcement. 
But we recognise that as the rates increase each year, employers, you know, might not want to make that commitment for five or 10 years um, ahead of time. So we ask employers to renew their accreditation each year. So it's that conscious decision that's made every year that you're still um, able to, to meet and remain committed to paying at least the real living wage. We do recommend that employers promote their accreditation. So yes, paying the rate and becoming accredited is important. And yes, that can help you secure contracts, um, you know, and, and win bids where those questions are being asked. But you get more out of it when you promote it. So tell your staff, take a photograph for social media, issue a press release. The local media might cover it as a as a good news story. Help us promote you too. Get involved with Living Wage Week, for example, the annual celebration of the Living Wage movement. We we feel that by promoting that you're a proud Living Wage employer, that you'll get more out of it in the end. So if you're interested in learning more about the real Living Wage and accreditation, please get in touch. We're here to help. And if you're curious to see some of the other employers that are celebrating their Living Wage commitment, do have a look on our social media. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, welcome to today's live Q and A panel session um, regarding the circular economy, fair work first, and net zero. Um, I'm delighted to be joined today here with Stuart Calderwood, Community Benefits and Sustainable Procurement Manager, Aberdeen City, uh, Shire and Highland Council, Emily Stone, Climate and Sustainability Business Development Manager at Edinburgh Science, and Lynn Anderson, Manager at Living Wage Scotland. For those of you who may not know, I am Gillian Cameron. I am the program manager with the Supplier Development Program. And we here at the Supplier Development Program are here to support you. We work with, directly with all 32 local authorities in Scotland, the Scottish Government, and a range of other public sector organisations who want to engage with micro, small, and medium sized businesses and support businesses. The aim of the program is to ensure that Scottish SMEs and third sector organisations have free access to tender training to assist them bid better for contracts uh, in the public sector, in your local authority area and across Scotland and further afield. And best of all, STP is free for an a business to access in Scotland. STP is also delighted to have hosted today's Meet the Buyer North event and I do hope that you've had a chance to visit some of the virtual stands and have enjoyed Circular Economy, Fair Work First and Net Zero session. There was a lot of information there, but a lot of brilliant information and facts. The net zero economy uh, and maintaining exemplary fair work standards clearly represents the biggest challenge facing not only Scotland, but the UK and further afield. And I do hope today's session has helped provide some great insight and guidance. So I'd like to ask you to start typing in your questions for our panel today using the right hand part of your screen. Please also note that we have a poll running in this session. So please vote on if carbon reduction, reaching net zero targets are a priority for your organisation, and also if this session has encouraged you to bid for public sector contracts. I'm going to ask our panel just to quickly introduce themselves first, and then we can get right on to the questions in the Q&A session. So if I could ask Stuart to go first, please. Uh, good morning, I'm Stuart Calderwood. I'm Community Benefits and Sustainable Procurement Manager with the Shared Procurement Service covering Aberdeen City, Aberdeenshire, and Highland Council. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Emily? Good morning, everyone. My name is Emily Stone. I'm Climate and Sustainability Business Development Manager at Edinburgh Science. Um, not only are we the charity that runs the Edinburgh Science Festival, but we have created the Net Zero Toolkit to help SMEs and other businesses on their journeys towards Net Zero. And then. Hi everyone, um, my name is Lynn Anderson. I work for the Poverty Alliance as Living Wage Scotland manager and we have an exhibition stand today, I'm sure. <laughs> so if you want to find out more outside of this session, uh, come and give us a visit there as well. That's great and that's a very good point because obviously you all have the stands at the event today so you can go along and ask directly in contact with the buyers there as well. Um, right, one of the first questions to get us started 
is about if community benefits and fair work practices are not scored, how does the buyer bring the information to bid process? Um, Stuart, maybe that's one for you to tackle. Certainly. Um, I mean, we definitely um, score community benefits, um, you know, and very often fair work, you know, forms part of community benefits, you know, so sometimes it can sit separately, but it, it is a form of social and economic value. So certainly that, that is an approach that, that we advocate is, is you know, scoring them so that they, they make an actual difference to the, the award decision and it allows the suppliers to kind of show their strengths because there's an awful lot of good practice out there. Thank you for that. Uh, Emily, uh, you were showing us your eight steps as part of your uh, toolkit. Um, is there any particular steps you have found that the suppliers are finding really, really useful? Is there something they're going to first of all? Absolutely. So I think um, that while all of the steps can be really useful, depending on what stage you're at of um, establishing your carbon management plan, step five in particular can be really, really helpful uh, for organisations who perhaps haven't considered the wider scope of their emissions. So you might have heard, for example, of scope three emissions, which are any emission that your business, perhaps it doesn't directly happen on the premises of your business, but it's something that you you buy, like a flight or um, potentially a a supply that you procure um, and it's kind of step five helps organizations figure out what's covered under those emissions figure out what they might be indirectly responsible for and then it um, provides links to resources which show how to kind of quantify those and how best to tackle those as well thank you for that um, right we've got another question just come in and it's asking about um Businesses have had a really tough time recently. They're struggling to afford to keep things going. Is it right that they're being asked to do more? And um, perhaps that's one to go to you, Lynn. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, we're in the business of asking companies to go further and, and pay beyond their legal requirements in terms of wage rates. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting question. Um, I think from our point of view, at Love Wage Scotland does a collective responsibility to try and rebuild our society and our economy, especially out of the, the challenges of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, and actually, we know that lots of businesses want to go further. So I think if what we're able to do is create ways that businesses can better evidence that, uh, it means they're able to get credit for what for the good stuff that they're already doing in many cases. Um, so I would say that we're these things, you know, net zero and fair work is not about asking businesses to go further um, in an unreasonable way, it's really just um, given an opportunity for uh, to spotlight some of the good practice that's already there. Um, and for those that perhaps aren't there yet, uh, there yet, um, I think that Stuart touched on this, it's about collaboration and partnership, isn't it? Uh, we're not, certainly for mine, we're not in the business of bashing any business for not paying the living wage. We want to learn uh, what the barriers are. Is it a lack of awareness? Is it affordability? Um, is it, you know, that there's a perceived kind of limited benefit of doing it? Um, so we can kind of support businesses in those conversations um, so that we can award the accreditation to more and more and build more awareness. I think that answers the question, but if there's any follow up, please let me know. That's great, Lynn. Uh, Stuart, do you want to add anything to that? I think, you know, we, we try to promote local sources of, of support, you know, you know, the demand is, is quite high, but there's there's very often local social enterprises and, and charities that can help bidders in delivering, you know, a lot of their community benefits commitment. So that's helping them to fulfil their social purpose and, you know, it, it's keeping the benefits, you know, being delivered locally. So, yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Um, a question that's come in is, if decisions are based on lowest costs, how does this work with community wealth building? Um, perhaps, Stuart, is that another one for you? I think, you know, the, the, the way that the, the, the Scottish uh, procurement regime is, we can't really do price only anymore. It, it's quite rare, you know, with the, the regulated threshold. So there's always some element of, of quality in there and community benefits and fair work are often good ways of, even if there's not an opportunity to, to have, you know, really considerable elements of, of quality. Price will still be really important in other areas, but it's quite rare, I think, these days to find price only. Okay, thank you for that. Um, another question we've got here is, 
What do buyers look for if you're quite a new supplier and you've not tended before? Um, do you have to be doing all these things at the beginning? Um, like, do you have to be an accredited living wage supplier uh, employer? If I could yeah. jump in on the living wage yeah, part sure. and then perhaps hand over to Stuart and then Emily. Um, you know, you don't have to be an accredited living wage employer to demonstrate your fair work practice. Of course, there's lots of other fair work things, you know, that are related to that question. But what I would say is that living wage accreditation, if you're able to pay the living wage, then it makes sense to become accredited because it's a easy, well, relatively simple process and, and relatively cost effective. And it makes it far easier from the buyer's point of view to to see that up front. And then they have to work. You, you don't, don't have to work as hard to find evidence of your fair work practice. It means that they can, you know, say like the fair pay part is covered off because they, they've got the accreditation. Let's move past and, and look at the other aspects of all the other good stuff that's happening. So I would say that um, for an employer that isn't living wage accredited, it just... If you're competing against another organisation that is, it's maybe a bit harder to get the bits in your bid to stand out um, because, you know, there's probably lots of other good stuff that, that other bidders are reporting in that category. But if they also have the accreditation, then it just might give them that competitive edge. Um, but no, you don't have to do everything. I would just say try and make it as easy as possible and find ways to demonstrate tangibly what what you are doing and um, but i'll hand over to others on that point just before you do lynn and um, just to confirm there's no cost to become accredited is there there is actually oh, <laughs> so, is there? all right <laughs> yeah, um, i mean lots of employers will choose to pay the living wage but of course because the living wage changes every year um the accreditation means that there's a guarantee that you remain committed to paying the most up-to-date rates um an employer might have chose to pay the living wage and and say that they're a living wage employer five years ago but Where's the evidence that they've kept pace right. with that? So we run this accreditation scheme. We operate this kind of national campaign to raise awareness of it. So we do charge a modest fee. Um, we are a charity. It goes straight back into the work that we do to raise awareness and tackle um, and work poverty. Um, so, yeah, but it starts, the smallest organisations say that employ less than 10 staff, it'll be £60 or £72 if you include the VAT. So it's a relatively modest fee, I would say. Stuart, did you want to add anything else to that? Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's not something that there's various things that we can't mandate in public procurement. And, you know, mandating payment across the board of, of real living wage is, some would say, unfortunately, something that we can't do. But it does cover many other aspects of, of fair work, including, you know, security of employment, quality of employment, access to training, equality in pay, things like that. So... We try to find workarounds and we, we also try to use a combination of what we call specified benefits, which are kind of more absolute contractual, non-negotiable. But we also include a lot of supplementary benefits, which are still taken seriously, scored, but they're more of a best endeavours. You know, so we're conscious that we don't want to create this shock to bidders, you know, mm -hmm. because we, we want SMEs to be as, as competitive as, you know, all suppliers. We don't want to rule anyone out, you know, who can't meet the standard. Right. Well, that was a very short session that we had here today. And I would just like to thank um, Stuart, Emily and Lynn all for taking part in today's panel question. We will be collating the questions. And um, as I said, you can go along to the stands and speak to the various uh, organisations here today. And I do hope you have enjoyed the event. Um, we know this is something new and challenging, but collectively um, we're all deeply committed to supporting SMEs to survive and thrive in these challenging times. Um, so we're here as STP to help support making the most of these connections. Um, and as you may be aware, we do offer free tender training via webinar um, over the whole range of subjects that are on here and we'll be adding to that throughout the year. Um, we really work hard to provide a vital link between suppliers and buyers to connect them, to keep you all up to date with information. Um, so keep connected with SDP and stay up to date with us. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook and LinkedIn. And I do hope that you have enjoyed today's event and to see you at some of our events coming up shortly. And um, there's lots more uh, inf information and uh, procurement sessions still to go, uh, including our top tips for tendering. So make sure you don't miss out on that. Um, and once again, I would just like to thank Jay, um, for helping out and for answering your questions forward to all supporting you going forward so thank you very much
Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the Thank rest you. of the event. Thank you very much. Bye.